Welcome to the Shots from the Winchester podcast presented by Greencastle. You may be wondering, when did John get tattoos and grow his hair out? Well, I'm not John. My name is Lindsay, and I'll be hosting the podcast intermittently. And I'm here with Bob Natal. Mm -hmm. Hey, Bob, how's it hey, going? Doing so well. So we're in the Winchester. So because we're in the Winchester, we're going to do a couple shots. So, Bob, what is your drink of choice? Well, we're in the Winchester, so let's make it a bullet. All right, Erica, two shots of bullet, please. Pouring these up fresh as we speak. There you go. All right. All Thanks, right. Erica. Okay. What are we toasting to? I mean, to Greencastle, right? All right. All right. Green Cheers. Castle. Cheers. That's, I forget how good that is, honestly. It goes down smooth every time. <laughs> it really does. So... Um, wanted to have you on because we're mm -hmm. doing um, get to know the Gacker. So for all of you who don't know what a Gacker is, that's people who work at Greencastle. Uh, so Bob, you're mm -hmm. the first victim. Yeah. <laughs> so happy to have you here. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to hear about what you do at Greencastle. So if you could tell everybody what your job is here and what you do. Yeah. So uh, at Greencastle, I'm a consultant on a utility project, primarily focused around budget control and controlling the finances for that project making sure that uh, whatever invoices uh, we're expecting are hitting accruals, um, you know, statement of cash flows that, you know, what we're anticipating a vendor to have uh, is actually matching with our invoicing, labor, looking at our labor estimates, making sure that people are charging their time correctly, um, you know, without getting too into the weeds, keeping it very high level. <laughs> you know, that's what I do. I mean, that's, that's, really good stuff and obviously very important here you know we work with a lot of really great clients and bob does some great work so how did you find yourself here i mean like every so to kind of back up everybody that works here is either currently serving or has served so we're veteran owned and operated 100 percent. so bob um obviously has some military background so we'd love to hear about what yeah. you did before this uh so i came uh i have a guard background I did uh, just over four years active, a mix of that was like AGR and some deployment stuff and training. Um, I got a message on LinkedIn one day that was, hey, you know, I got an opportunity. I just moved back into the country and got this message. Hey, we have the opportunity coming up and, uh, you know, we'd like to talk with you a little bit more about your interests and stuff. And I thought I was getting like another LinkedIn spam message. Uh, but, you know, I was, uh, I, I, there were a couple things in the messages that just stood out. I was like, all right, you know what, I'm going to call this. I'll, I'll actually call back and, and set up some time to talk with this person. And uh, it worked out. And three years later, here I am. Awesome. So in the military, what was your job? Uh, so I was on a civil support team when I was AGR, um, which is primarily a seabird response force. And now in the Guard, I continue to serve as an emergency manager uh, in the Air Guard, which is mixing that sea burn along with kind of like a FEMA type role of, you know, making sure the plans for emergency response are in place. Very cool. So obviously you've got that part of your life going on. We know that yeah. takes up a lot of time. Yep. Um, you know, you've got this, which also takes up a lot of time in a very good way. Yeah. But then you have stuff going on outside of here. I know yes. you are into fitness and you do cross country mountain biking. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So correct. can you tell me a little bit about that? Like what that is, what that means? Yes. So, uh, you know, t it's July right now. Tour France is going on, you know, for listeners that aren't aware. A uh, little bit different Tour France. So, uh, you know, a lot, you might have ridden a mountain bike on, or at least passed somebody on a trail occasionally. Uh, and it's not like, the it's not like thinking like downhill where you see those commercials and stuff where people are with all the gear and helmets on uh you know bombing down some hills and going off jumps uh it's more like a mix between that uh road cycling mentality where you know we're we're wearing <laughs> we're wearing the funny suits um but we're going for you know usually anywhere from seven to uh, under a regular race up to 20 miles. Um, ultras, they get into 50 plus, mile, 50 plus miles, so 100, 
miles being an ultra um, at, or an endurance race of like four hours would be around four hour mark. So holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're racing on single track trails and stuff through the woods, flying around at 20 miles an hour, dodging trees. It's fun. So you said four yeah. hours. That's, yeah. that's what it takes you to do. How, how much like distance? So, uh, for an endurance race, uh, where there'd be four hours like that, uh, the league that I'm currently riding in, the endurance race is set up where you do a four hour, uh, it's a four hour time clock as many laps as you can get in in four hours uh, one lap is usually around like seven miles um, my first endurance race will be the end of the summer actually uh, so I've been kind of training up and building up to that there are guys that will easily do like 50 miles in in that four hour time period uh, so once you get you know four hours in then it's the first per then you know as you finish that lap you know you're cut off some people only get three laps in. You're required to get three laps in. Otherwise, you don't qualify. Uh, other people get, you know, eight <laughs> laps in. So uh, it's it's wild. It's fun, though. It's a lot of fun. That's good. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm going to assume that there's a lot of training that goes into that, though. Yes. So what, is, is. what does the training look like? How many hours are you training a week? How much time are you spending on the bike? Uh, so I spend roughly seven to eight hours a week in the saddle uh, training either on a trainer or uh, out on the road uh, or on the trail. So endurance rides, if I can get out um, on the road and I can't hit a trail, I try to use my road bike to help out uh, and I'll go out for a two hour ride on, on the road bike. Uh, if not, then I'm on the trainer for two hours at a time. Uh, Which yeah. that I'm imagining that's what you're doing when it's not great weather outside. Like, so mm -hmm. like when the winter rolls around, your training, I'd imagine kind of transitions into the indoor yep. element. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or even early morning hours and the trainer, the great part about the trainer is I can set it up with the program that I want to run and road biking will never have the same uh, demands physically that uh, riding on trail would have. Mm -hmm. So I can set up a program where it's going to, increase the resistance, you know, in, in intervals that I need it to, to simulate going up and down hills and stuff like that. And, you know, sustain that, whereas I'm not going to get that out on the road. Uh, so even though I'm stuck in one spot, I can still kind of get that same level of effort. in. yeah, that's really impressive. What Thanks. kind of trainer do you have? Do you have one of those <laughs> where like it's the, the rollers and you get on and you have to like keep pedaling or you're going to tip over or do you have like no. the one where you clip into no. it? No. So mine is a direct uh, drive trainer. Uh, I have a Wahoo Smart. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it. I, when I first bought it, I was a little apprehensive. They're not always cheap. Uh, it's been an amazing purchase though. Because yeah. you look at like people that have Pelotons and stuff and it's cheaper than a Peloton, but uh, I can then take my bike out and actually go ride my bike. Yeah. Which is awesome. I have a Peloton. It's not, not the same as the, yeah. the outdoor stuff. You know, we, we want to pretend that it is, but it, yeah. it's, it's certainly not. So you placed recently, yep. right? In one of your races. Can you yeah. tell us about that experience and like, you know, how many people were there? How did it feel placing? Uh, it was wild uh, because I recently, as I, I, told you before uh, like I just finished my MBA which like everybody would think is like this you know, elation like this feeling of amazing you finally two years you're done um getting to place like that uh, I only placed third um uh, that was my last race my upcoming one in two weeks I'm hoping I've been training a little harder I'm hoping to uh, up those numbers but uh I uh the feeling was amazing uh I was in pure shock when I came through the finish line and I remember I, was, I didn't know exactly how far I had to race. Uh, not because it was an unknown. There are some that are unknown. It was just because I didn't remember how long they said the course was going to be for me when I started. And so I kept checking my mileage, checking my mileage. And there were like people on the sidelines cheering on friends and family. And they'd be at different trail heads or intersections. And I, I'd yell them, hey, do you know how long this trail is? <laughs> how long the course is? And they're like, I don't what are you talking about? It's like, <laughs> thanks. Uh, and I knew I was getting to the end cause I knew, you know, just, I, I could kind of start to see and get a feeling. And, uh, I was coming up over this rock and the photographer said something to me about like, don't get a flat or 
So along those lines, and all I heard was you got a flat. And at this point, I knew that I was like, I was in the top three. I didn't know where. And I just remember thinking, you know, I jumped off my bike. I was freaking out. I looked at her. I was like, I got a flat. <laughs> and she looks at me, no, 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 no. I was saying, don't get a flat. So when I finally crossed that finish line, I was looking at people like, I'm pulling up my phone. Where are the results? Where are the results? Uh, so when I finally did actually like find out for sure, I place, I'd never had anything like that in my life before. The sheer joy. I was talking with somebody recently about this who just completed their first, like their first half Ironman and the sense of accomplishment that you have for me, it was, I don't know if it's just cause it was so immediate and it's just such uh, a level of effort that you're putting out in such a short period of time. Uh, cause I mean, I'm, I'm giving it my all for like an hour. It's just, my heart rate is maxed out and I'm focused on nothing else. So when I finally got to go up there and got my little award and like, you know, they took everybody's picture on the podium. It was, it was a really amazing feeling. I was really excited. My wife was there and she's like, all right, yeah, this is great. I don't get it. But it's, uh, when, if, when you are in that situation, it, it's wild. And, and I mean, you recently got to share in that, like that same kind of feeling, right? So like yeah. how, you know, how for you did that feel? Like, I mean, it's just, you you've worked up to something and then to like finally get rec- some recognition for it it's, yeah. it's amazing I, right i think a lot of it is like that sacrifice the sacrifice yeah. that you put in you know when you're training right yeah. you have to make sacrifices if you want to be good at something yeah. and so like it's kind of that like okay what i did was worth it <laughs> yeah. kind of thing it's like all right very it like reaffirms kind of the work that you put in which yeah. yes it's a great feeling so that's really cool. And yeah. like, it's really impressive that you did that while you're bouncing all this, this other stuff. Like yeah. that's no small feat, you know, on top of, you said you, you finished your MBA from yep. Penn state. Yep. You also have a five month old yes. daughter, right? So son, son. son I'm sorry, yeah. son. Yeah, right. yeah. So, I mean, that's a lot of stuff that you're doing and yeah. like, you know, you just had that race. You have a, an infinite home. I mean, yeah. very impressive. Yeah. Very Thank impressive. You. And then on top of that, not, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the other things about you. Um, mm-hmm. You like to hunt, right? Yep. So you you do archery. and yep. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, avid archery hunter, uh, pheasant hunter, and fly fisherman. So I always say, like, I'm an avid outdoorsman. I also, when I get the time, rock climb, whitewater raft, kayak, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, like, with the archery hunting, there's, it's uh, similar to the mountain biking where there's a lot of training that goes into it, at least for me. You know, I shoot. After work today, I've already talked to my wife about it. We're going to go. She also has a bow. And that's something we kind of share together is archery. So it's not just the hunting piece for me, but it's also, you know, we go and my wife and I will shoot together in the backyard and it's time together. But, you know, multiple days a week, I'm, I'm even in the winter, I have a target set up in my basement. So, like, we're, I'm shooting year-round. That's impressive. Yeah. And not just archery, right? So you're... you're <laughs> pheasants i think yeah, you said yeah but i also and, do pheasants. i don't really know a whole lot about that so i'm not going to pretend to. yeah it's not a little less dedication <laughs> okay. well i put a little less dedication into that one do you have a dog that you use for hunting like with you i know that's like a very popular thing it is very popular i do have a dog uh <laughs> she was trained at one point training she doesn't go hunting anymore <laughs> <laughs> what kind of dog uh she was a rescue she's a mountain cur mix okay yeah Okay, yeah. cool. And we're just yeah. going to keep stacking things on here. You're also yeah. a volunteer firefighter. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How long have you been doing that for? So I started in November 2005. Uh, actually, November 15th, 2005. One of those days you just remember getting sworn in. Um, and I've been doing it in some capacity ever since. So I was uh, started as a volunteer in high school. I, to date myself here, like I graduated in 2006 so uh, you know I started as a senior in high school did my fire one academy EMT my senior year then I went on advanced fire training I lived in a couple firehouses and then I then I joined the military I joined the military actually at 22 and then I've worked as a federal firefighter and also uh, for the guard I was a firefighter for a little bit as well so I, I have no idea what a federal firefighter does um, what is that 
So think any federal facility, even a lot of military bases, the okay. fire the fire protection on that base is civilian. Uh, so it might not necessarily be uh, a military firefighter. So in the Army, I think they're 21 Deltas mm-hmm. is the MOS for those guys. Um, you know, if there's – because of deployment cycles and stuff like that, it always uh, is beneficial to have a civilian force there. Um, so, you know, for instance, down Dover Air Force Base, they have civilian firefighters that are there. They're DOD civilian firefighters. I worked at the VA, uh, so I got a lot of firsthand experience at the VA too, which was really amazing uh, to see, you know, vets and get to help them out and stuff like that. Uh, but it was – yeah, I worked uh, to provide fire suppression and protection for the VA specifically, but then we had mutual aid agreements with the surrounding cities to actually go out and go on their fires, and it was, it was a good experience, yeah. I, I really, truly, like, do not know how you have the time to do all this stuff, but, I mean, you're in the right spot when you're trying to figure out how to get things done, you know, like, yeah. that's the motto here, right? Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> So that's, you know, you're figuring it out, which is pretty impressive. Sacrifice. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's worth it, you know? Like, usually that's it is. worth it. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's uh, rewarding. Yeah. So. And speaking of rewarding. Yes. You mentioned to me that you're donating 1% of your paycheck. Yes. Yes. I'd love so. to hear more about where that idea came about and who you've been donating to or like, are you doing it per paycheck? No. Or? So, uh, so the way I have my pay set up right now, um, is that I have like 1% actually split off. So if it's anything monthly, but you know, any account incentive is going off to this other separate savings account. Uh, so I'm not making the donations every month. Uh, I'm waiting until I get, you know, some kind of balance and then I split it off to, um, Organizations that are near and dear to me, being an outdoorsman, you know, environmental, um, you know, firefighter, near and dear to me, fire department, uh, and then, and fire, you know, any kind of organization that's going to provide any support to firefighters, and then obviously veteran, Mm -hmm. um, because those are kind of like my focuses and my passions, right? Uh, And the thought behind that was, you know, I, I led, and maybe, I don't know, similar story or not, you, and it's been at least a similar story I've had talking with other veterans. Uh, you lead this life of purpose for so long. Mm-hmm. I was a firefighter since high school. I lived at firehouses. I joined the military. I was even a firefighter in the military. I got out of the military. I was a firefighter for a little bit. Coming into more of a corporate setting, um, where it kind of takes, I can still volunteer, but I can't volunteer to the same degree that I did before. Um, trying to make that your have my life like have the same purpose or finding that sense of purpose before and I listened because I'm a really slow reader I listened to the audiobook uh, Let My People Go Surfing by uh, Yvonne Chouinard the guy from Patagonia and he has this whole one percent for the planet and I thought to myself all right well doing business for the greater good and thought to myself you know what is one percent it's kind of small and if i set it up to where i don't even see it it's almost like a tax coming off um it it helps kind of make me feel you know I, I get to feel it in here right business for the greater good and i feel like i'm doing something and contributing at least i might not be able to do it um you know physically anymore um which physically it takes its toll on your body after a while um, but at least I can do so through other means. And a lot of these organizations, you know, they, they do need funding, especially, you know, the nonprofits. So, um, yeah, it's just, it, it's, uh, when I was growing up, because I always believed in volunteering and stuff, there was this uh, proverb I remember. It was, if you have much, give of your wealth. If you have little, give of your heart. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, the tables have turned a little bit for me. So, yeah. I love that. Yeah. I, that and that's like kind of the takeaway, right? Is like yeah. I think if I had to high level touch on all the things we talked about is, you know, service yep. and sacrifice. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. I yeah. Mean, I mean that's that's it. So Bob, it's been really great talking to you. It's been I, wonderful. I really appreciate you joining us. And yeah. uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks everybody. <laughs>